Hi, I'm Emily Hazard. And I'm Becca Anderson. And this is Grey's Anatomy Uncut, a podcast where we discuss and analyze episodes of Grey's Anatomy. Today, we are finally starting season two, season two, episode one, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, originally written for the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and sung by B.J. Thomas. I've never heard of that movie. I actually have. I just haven't watched it. It's old. Oh, and gotcha. I, I like that title, one, because it's in Seattle, and two, it may be perhaps a nod to the constant rain that we will see in the background of this episode, and the only two times that Meredith talks to Derek in this entire episode happen to be in, like, downpours, so. Makes Interesting. sense. Um, original air date is, what is that, September? Is that September? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> September 25th, 2005. What's the ninth month? <laughs> Written by Stacy McKee, directed by Peter Horton. He's back. He's back and better than ever. Yeah. And it had 18.98 million viewers. Who? Which sounds impressive, but it's actually down, I think, from the finale. So that's kind of weird. That is weird. I feel like all the people who watched the finale, finale would have come back, you know, to see, like, mm. what the heck happened. Yeah. But- Maybe they mm. were busy that night. Maybe they just recorded it. I mean, did, did we have recording? I don't think reco- no, they didn't. <laughs> JK, <laughs> you couldn't DVR it then. Yeah, so sucks for them. But anyway, um, so we have a tremendous amount of follow up. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is, I really wanted to do best episode title just based on the title alone, not like anything that happens in the episode. And we totally forgot it. So um, my best episode title was 106, If Tomorrow Never Comes. I just love it. Mm-hmm. Mine is A Hard Day's Night. I don't know. I just really like it. That's the first episode ever. One thing I'll say about that is that I am so in love with the fact that they gave the pilot episode a title. Most Instead shows just, just call it pilot, and yeah. the, I don't know why, but that bothers me so much. The only time I feel like that ever worked was on Lost, because it was like a double meaning. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That's the only time I, I've been okay with that. And the other thing that we forgot last episode, oh my god, I feel so bad about this. We literally forgot Burke's character analysis. I don't know how we did that. <laughs> what? So anyway, we're just going to do a really short one right now. Yeah. I guess I'll go. Yeah, In season one, uh, Burke really just plays two major roles in the show, which is Christina's love interest and a competition for Derek. And I think to any viewer, those are like the obvious things. But I really like all the subtle work that Isaiah Washington, who plays Burke, and the writers do with this character. Because episode one... Burke is this really strict character and there's really not much for the fans to latch onto or root for. And then just in these nine episodes, he like shows the soft side for one. And he just like, I don't know what it is. It's like he shows a completely different side of himself. So by the time we're in episode nine, we're like, whoa, looking back on episode one, we've learned so much about Burke. And I feel like a lot of people miss it, but in season one, I think mm-hmm. he is the character that's grown the most. And I think mostly because of Christina. Well, and that's kind of what I like is, you know, you see so much growth in Burke, but he's not a main character. You know, we don't really get, you know, he's not a Meredith or a Christina or anything like that. But we do get so much, like looking back from the first episode and then from <laughs> to like episode nine, and you're just like, is he even the same person? Like... It almost seems completely different. And yet he but it is feels still natural. that, like, strict Burke from, like, the first episode, mm-hmm. which I kind of like. And I just want to address one of the biggest complaints about Burke from when most people, like, figure out how obsessed I am with Grey's Anatomy, they want to talk to me about it. And they say, and I, you know, start asking questions They're like, oh, how do you feel about Izzy? How do you feel? And whenever I get to, oh, and how do you feel about Burke? They're like, he's so boring and he's so bad for Christina. And I just want to, like, like, as soon as somebody says that, I'm like, oh, so you're not really looking at it on the same level as someone like Becca or myself. Because how can you even watch this show and say that? I just don't get it. I mean, do Mm -hmm. you, have you ever come across people that say that? Oh, definitely. 
Yeah. I just don't get it. Like, he's not in your face likable like George and Izzy are, but that's the whole point. Like, he's subtle. I feel like he's one of those characters that you may not notice on a first watch through, but on a rewatch, you're like, holy crap, this is like, where was he the first time I watched it? It's like one of those things where you rewatch it and then you're kind of like, wow, he is a great character and it's awesome. Yeah. And I feel like, I think the common complaint with him and like the fact that he's not good for Christina is what will end up coming later in their relationship and stuff. Cause you know, like there's obviously some things, like some big things that they disagree on. And I personally, like, I think that comes from more of the fact that like both of them are kind of still immature and not necessarily that they're not good for each other. I just think they need to learn how to work together in a lot of their relationships and stuff. But I still think like they, fit together so well and they bring out some of the best qualities in each other like it's yeah they're just so yeah. good and the characters her really next love push... interest is not <laughs> yeah they like push each other and we we learn new things about christina because of burke and we learn new things yeah. about burke because of christina and another thing that i'll say about all the people that complain about later it's like oh they're so terrible for each other when you're watching a tv show or any form of media you have to be able to step back a little bit and realize that there are actual people writing these characters. These aren't real people. You know what I mean? They're mm-hmm. being controlled by writers. I mean, the classic example is George and Izzy, but I won't go into that right now. But like, if Burke and Christina are so good on screen and later something is written that, said, that makes you think that they're not good together, that... I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it, that's the right like for drama. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. It's like, they're not making their own decisions. You get that, right? It's for that interest factor of like it being a TV show. Well, I don't even know if I'd say it's that. It's just that people are like, well, I'll, I'll cite blah, 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 and say, oh, that's why they're bad for each other. And I was like, that's clearly written so you think that. Yeah. But if you look at all the other things, all the other pieces adding up to it that one thing that the writers really like at the last minute want you to think it doesn't add up to that yeah it's hard to explain so anyway uh, it's hard to explain when we haven't met her other love interest because i feel like the common debate is like which one's better for her and so it's hard to talk about one without talking about the other yeah we We'll have long convos about that later. So anyway, the last follow-up I want to do is we're actually changing up the format of the podcast slightly. We are just taking best moments out of the beginning, and we'll just talk about our best moments within the podcast because we felt like the intro, ironically, was too long, and we just wanted to jump into the actual episode and stop you know, messing around in the beginning. And then I know that we promised... (laughs) <laughs> in the first or second episode of this podcast that we were, are not a recap podcast. And then in about episode seven or eight, we turned into a complete recap episode or podcast. <laughs> and so we're really, really trying to like cut it down and become a analysis podcast. Yeah. So if you were thinking, oh, I don't really need to watch the episodes to listen to it. Now you do. <laughs> Just kidding. It's like it's in your face. Like. Pow, pow, pow. No. So anyway... <laughs> <laughs> do you have an in, uh opening statement yeah i personally re- i mean like obviously i love this episode i don't think we've had an episode that i haven't loved yet um but it's just such a good episode um for a lot of different reasons i like how this episode occurs first off it's like mere minutes after where season one finale leaves us off because i feel like in a lot of shows and even later in this show there's always that kind of disconnect between a finale and then the start of a new season and so i kind of like how we literally end in the finale with you know this huge revealing moment for meredith and then this episode opens you know probably like 15 minutes later with her like across the street at joe's bar Mm -hmm. so i kind of like how that it's just it continues on the plot and i feel like it really helps us to get like to see where meredith is coming and we don't miss like any of her thinking which i kind of like right because if there had been a time jump it would have felt disconnected well and i feel like if there had been a time jump they would have tried to like resolve things 
during the time jump and it's like no like we want to know how all of this is like resolved and how like you know like how Meredith is figuring this out how Derek and Addison are figuring all of this stuff out like we want to know that as it's happening and so I feel like that was really effective in starting yeah, and I mean, like where they did they set up this brilliant storyline and if they had done a time jump that would have been just such a waste like we want to know all the reactions because yeah. we're really invested so it's like they like kicked over the first domino and like the finale and now it's like all of the rest like all of the uh, next reaction counter reaction no it's like the butterfly effect yeah i know what you're whatever about. it's yeah, like a I snowballing I, yeah that snowball effect okay <laughs> i also really like we get two really big character introductions in this episode we get joe and addison whom pretty much all of the characters act as if they've you know seamlessly been in this like the show all along which is super interesting because you know theoretically joe kind of has been there all along because you know they're like talking about these moments you know meredith talks about oh like yeah like i was in this bar before my first day in the job and you know we had that scene earlier in the season so you know he's theoretically been there all along but addison hasn't which i think is so interesting because everyone i feel like is acting like they've known her forever you yeah, know, we, I know. See, we see so many moments of that where they're just like oh hey addison and you're like how the hell did all of these people know about the existence of this woman they and how didn't did no one tell meredith but they didn't it's so weird we'll get to it yeah. when we get to it but well, it's so think- weird like i noticed that too i was just like does everyone just know her automatically <laughs> well and i think that for the writers and i like i'm not gonna try to get into this too much of this now i think that's just like a nod at her character and how she's so easy to love even though like we all want to hate her so bad because we're like oh she's evil she's the evil wife or whatever but then you're like no she's awesome i love her and so i think that was kind of like what they were going for and lastly the thing that i really like is that we get a whole new look at the whole you know love triangle cheating story because I like how even though, you know, in this situation, you really look at it black and white on paper, Meredith is really the only true victim because she had no knowledge of any of this, you know, but like Mm -hmm. somehow throughout the episode, you know, like as we gain more information about it, I find myself feeling bad for like Addison and Derek, even though like theoretically, you know, like Addison's the one that cheated and that kind of caused this effect. But I'm like, no, I feel horrible for her. And I think that's such an interesting thing that the fact that they have this like, you know, cheating is this whole huge like scenario and it's caused so many problems for everyone. But you're like, I almost don't know who the victim is because I feel sorry for everyone in the situation. So I kind of like how that was written and how they did that throughout the episode. Yeah. So, I mean, what I want to talk about is you hit on a lot of stuff, but two things that really stuck out to me when I was rewatching this episode and kind of analyzing it in my head was this was a very successful example of how Grey's Anatomy almost completely broke a structure that they've built. So a lot of the episodes you can say function the same way, you know, like it starts at Meredith's house in the morning, they they go on rounds, they each are assigned patients, the patients, you know, are meaningful and then they go home is kind of how season one was operating but yeah. this one really does break up the structure because one it starts immediately right where the other one left off at night starts in a in joe's bar alex and izzy aren't even like tethered to a patient and to some degree neither is george and yeah it kind of just revolves around meredith Derek, and addison mm-hmm. and but it's done so well. Like, this is how you break the structure up successfully. And then the other thing I just wanted to talk about was the way that they handled Meredith Derrick Addison was yeah. crucial to the success of this episode. And I think that they did it really well. It sets up the fact that Meredith is the only true victim on paper. Yeah. But it's like, as the viewer, it's almost like we're getting... We're learning everything from Meredith's point of view, which is brilliant because it makes the viewer seem like the only true victim. But you're right when you say that, like, at the end, we're like, holy crap, I feel bad for Derek. Or at the end, you were like, wow, Addison is kind of a victim here, too. So it really grays everything when in the beginning it seems very black and white. Hashtag grays anatomy. And yeah. 
it's just it's brilliant like it it draws you in because how many times has a a cheating storyline been done on television too many to count but this one seems unique so yeah yeah. well and it's just so interesting because like as you said like by the end of the episode like the blame like fault lines are so blurred and you're just kind of like all right what really did happen and who is at fault here because it seems like there's just so much going on in this and that you know like there's you know like multiple people are to blame and you're just kind of like what well as humans we we literally want to just point the blame at somebody and we can't in this episode so yeah well because like again so many people had something to do with this Mm -hmm. all right so let's get into it to be a good surgeon you have to think like a surgeon emotions are messy tuck them neatly away and step into a clean sterile room where the procedure is simple cut suture and close but sometimes you're faced with a cut that won't heal a cut that rips its stitches wide open this is so meta (laughs) yeah it is (laughs) meredith is telling us to think in black and white but when you do that then you're presented with something not black and white and it can rip the stitches wide open yeah it's really clever it is i like it so first scene we get the first glimpse of joe's bar as you knowing it as joe's bar that's kind of cool what do you think about it i mean i i love joe's bar just on a superficial level i really love like the atmosphere in that bar like yeah it's kind of like dark and i don't know it's just like exactly what i would expect to be a bar in seattle or something yeah or like a bar that like all these surgeons go to Mm -hmm. i mean she's stuff she is downing shots of tequila here. She is. She that's like a ton of tequila shots, and she is still like completely like me. Like, Remember in she, episode five when she drank a whole bottle of tequila? Yeah, but like this is so funny because you know like later when Joe falls over and collapses, her and Christina are like just downing like medical jargon to each other, and I'm just like, she's like like I think she had at least like six shots in that like opening scene, and you're like this woman is still able to like perform medicine like what and we do we do get some classic meredith like f my life lines once that worked out real well my boyfriend is my boss which was the problem so i do mm, this is a great scene so then we get the Derek and addison scene first first real look at addison what are your thoughts on this honestly I love her so much. The way she handles But try the try scene. to look at this like it's the first time yeah. watching it. Like I mean, I still remember this whole episode. I was like, I hate this woman. I hate this woman. I hate this woman. But the fact of the matter, just some of these lines that she delivers and you're just like she's so hard to hate. Yeah. And like you keep telling she's, yourself you're like like she broke up Meredith, like I have to hate her, but then you're like but she's so awesome damn it <laughs> and stuff like i like how he's literally just like what are you doing here and she's like your hair is different <laughs> and then she's just like it's very uh russell crowe and i was like yes <laughs> and then i st- i still love the whole like he's like if you came out here to try and win me back forget about it and she's like i did and you're like ugh. and she like goes off on this whole thing like i flew all the way across the country to reminisce over wedding photos get drunk fall into bed and make you realize you can't live without me and then she's just like be for real derek (laughs) i love how derek again tries to make it about himself (laughs) but one thing i do want to talk about is what do you think about when addison calls meredith the anti-addison as i said i think in a way yes she is but they're also very similar in ways Mm -hmm. um many we kind of haven't really seen right now because you know like we're just really getting our first glimpses at her Um, and addison hasn't seen yet yeah so like you know with our knowledge right now of the two of them i definitely think meredith is and i think the biggest reason is i was i was really trying to think of like where derek's mindset would have been like when he got to seattle because you know he's theoretically just seen his wife you know like his best friend the love of his life everything cheating on him and so like you know you have to think that he saw her in a way as like tainted or like i almost want to not even like damaged seems too harsh but just kind of like 
not who he thought she was and just kind of he just like saw her in a new light and that was kind of different and then he sees Meredith who is this young innocent very naive person and I think he was kind of like this is like the old Addison or like how I used to see her or what he wanted Mm -hmm. and you know you do have you know Addison the very basic you know Addison is this amazing surgeon who's already pretty much built her career whereas Meredith is the wide-eyed you know intern as she said um, who is you know building her career so I think in this moment when they're talking and what they know about each other yes she is the Anna Addison. Well, and I also actually talked about that in episode one of the of the whole podcast about how I feel like Derek is attracted to Meredith because he is desperate for a fresh start, and she is literally the definition. and metaphorically a fresh start. Like, yeah, it, it was her first day of work, you know. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. Oh my god, can I just read this part? <laughs> He asked me to to come. He didn't tell you? Derek. No, he didn't. Hmm. Well, surprise. <laughs> I die every time she says that. It's it's like mm-hmm. deadpan and Kate Walsh kills it. That's I think this scene was one of the first scenes cuz I I like still pretty well like remember the first time I watched this. And I think it took me like three or four episodes into season 2 for you to be like, "So Becca, what do you think of Addison?" And I just was like, I want to hate her so bad, but I can't (laughs) because she's awesome. It took me longer than that, actually. And like when I first watched it, I didn't like her until like season three, uh, which seems insane to me now because, oh my God, I love everything about her. But I I was also nine. So honest to God, like Kate Walsh, I feel like was perfect for this role. And she came out of nowhere, to be honest. Yeah. Because I mean, like this whole first scene, how she delivers all of these lines is amazing and it's super interesting because i feel like if you think about you know like this wife coming back and like seeing her husband like oh and here's your like the woman you've been sleeping with like i feel like you would think that she'd have this like angry like uh, or even like sad like come back to new york with me but she's just kind of like whatever (laughs) she's such a diva and it's awesome yeah so i kind of love i love that so okay but we get a few hater now (laughs) Let's go over to when George and Christina come in the bar mm-hmm. and everyone already knows that George like punched Alex. Yeah. And didn't that happen like 20 minutes ago? But anyway, um, basically, so they come over to sit with Meredith and this has got to be one of the best Meredith lines <clears throat> of all time. She just like looks over in this like deadpan, like I hate my life. She goes, let's play a game of whose life sucks the most. I'll win. I always win. <laughs> Some something about the way Ellen delivered that was just hand great brilliant. She plays this like really sad but slightly drunk Meredith so well throughout the whole show. Yeah, like it. No, just, it's awesome. She just plays it so well. That's I just love the best best part about this whole thing. Derek's married, and then George just like spits all over the freaking bar. It like and, comes out of his nose. Yeah, well, because he probably like inhaled it and yeah. then like shot it out of his nose and then it's just like (laughs) dripping everywhere but i also really like like he's completely because when this happens the camera is like by meredith's head so he's like in the background and yet he's completely in focus when she says this (laughs) and he like spits Mm -hmm. the beer out yeah so when george leaves to go you know clean himself up and his long sleeve short sleeve combo again Christina tells Meredith that she's pregnant, and then Joe goes down, goes down hard. So mm-hmm. that's what happens there. We're going to cut over to Izzy, well, all the interns except for Alex in the hallway. And Izzy's just like, don't you have a date with McDreamy? More like McMarried. And I was like, oh my God, George, you you were like workshopping that so hard. Yeah. And then I, st- I just like how Izzy can do, Mc what? <laughs> The beginning then, of McLanguage. <laughs> oh, no, it's not even the beginning. It's just, like, the the fact that Izzy just is so dedicated to this yeah. language. She's just like, what? So, then Derek. Just, can we talk about how... Cutting into another scene. Well, not, not even just that. Can we talk about how bad his judgment in this episode is? He's just, like, already walking up to Meredith as if that didn't just happen, like, literally a half an hour ago, yeah. tops. Well, I feel like... I mean, in his defense, 
you know, obviously he wants to explain because I think in his point of view, he feels to be the wronged one. Right, but I mean, he he can't deny the fact that he also wronged somebody else. You know what I mean? Well, I think, no, but I think him until later in the episode i think this whole time he's like meredith listen to me like i'm the wronged one and i think he like doesn't understand where her hurt is and i think he just wants her to understand and be like no like i was wronged and i don't think until later he truly gets that it's like no you wronged her too like yeah and there's a debate there where you can say he doesn't really understand that until much later in the show like he doesn't really get what he did to her yeah so yeah and then the whole meredith the i'm drunk it's brilliant and then derek's like meredith and that's like the first time ever derek patrick dempsey has probably said that line just said meredith like and then followed her so many times i so and then oh this little touch of all the interns blocking derek and then izzy going mcbastard i was like katherine heigl mm you're awesome that's well and i love the fact that you know theoretically like two episodes ago izzy was pissed at meredith for like sleeping with derek you know george wasn't happy because he liked meredith and whatnot but they are all still so on her side and having her back in this situation and i just i love this friendship that they've all formed it's amazing magic well, it's also i feel like it's also or- izzy is just pissed at anyone who would cheat like this is a big deal not tell somebody that you're married i mean that's not yeah something so this is coming up on one of my favorite scenes so we're kind of gonna go deeper into this one it the song playing looking at the world from the bottom of a well by mike daughtry it's on the first Grey's anatomy cd so Mm -hmm. do you want to do the dialogue for this because i feel like this is really important so i will be meredith meredith Go away. Just wait. We should discuss this. Here's a thought. No. Quit following me. At least let me explain. Explain? You know when you should have explained? The night we met in the bar. Before any of the rest of it. Yeah, that would have been a good time to discuss it. Look, I know how you feel. Do you? Somehow I doubt that. Because if you did, you would shut up and you would turn around and go back inside because you would realize that I am this close to getting in my car and running you down in the parking lot. Awesome. Which is just like, so, because I feel like, because this completely just shows how he thinks. He's like, I need to tell you why I was wronged and like all this stuff. And she's just like, no, you don't understand how angry I am right now at you and like how the fact that like even looking at you just pains me and pisses me off well I feel like Derek is clueless with a k here yeah I mean like he is like and Ellen and then, Pompeo murders this scene oh, it's yeah. awesome and then the whole like look I know how you feel like no you don't Derek like I mean like obviously like you were wronged in the sense that like Addison cheated on you but that's not the same hurt as meeting someone who has lied to you for the entire course of the relationship well and it also makes meredith feel like she was way more into this relationship than he was because from her point of view right now it's it's a rebound yeah and i she was she's really in love with this man or even like a way to get back at addison yeah like she feels used yeah and he like does not understand that at all yeah, and him trying to talk to her right now in this situation is demeaning. And I don't think he gets that. Mm-hmm. Well, and honestly, like, I don't think until she said the whole thing about, like, running him down in the parking lot. I don't, like, his face when she walks away is just like, wow, she really is mad at me. And you're like, no, duh. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think he just understood how mad and at him, which, like, it's completely understandable, like... Well, stuff. what was his what was his end game here? Let's think about this. Let's really yeah. think about this. What the heck was he going to do? Mm-hmm. It was gonna come out eventually. Like, was his end game to like get her drunk on wine and steak and stuff, and then just be like, "Oh, by the way, I'm married." Yeah. I mean, this was not going to end well either way. So, I, I maybe it's that he was almost resigned to that for a while. True. Maybe. But, oh God, it's I so just... cringeworthy, but it's brilliant. And also, yeah. the veins that are popping out of Ellen Pompeo's neck mm. in the scene <laughs> yes. are are actors of their own. She's, like, standing in the rain, but not getting wet. 
she's immune. She's married. Like, you can see, like, gray. like, there's, like, a little bit of wetness on her jacket, but, like, her hair is still, like, completely dry and, like, everything. And I'm just like, okay, Meredith. This is why she lives in Seattle, because she's immune to the rain. Yeah, so, anyway, so, like, Derek is... <laughs> He's storming into the chief's hospital room to, you know, go unload his man pain on oh him. Oh, my God. And Addison is already in there, like, telling jokes and just peeing all over his territory. <laughs> and then, like, Addison just, like, kisses the chief on the forehead and leaves. And I was just like, Addison Montgomery, ugh, it's awesome. She's just like, yeah, I'm already better friends with everyone here than you. I've already made more friends here than you have in 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And then... I just, I, Derek literally is just like, you totally chose this to spite me, like, chief, like, oh, this is so personal for me. And the chief is like, I I don't care. The chief is like, you get that I'm running a business, right? Like, I brought the best people out here to save people's lives and to make more money. This is a business. This isn't about you and your dumb personal life. Yeah. Well, and you even have to think, you know, like, the last episode, the chief saw like meredith and derek together and in a certain way like the chief kind of is a father figure to meredith so you're also kind of like derek what do you think was going to happen here like the chief knows you're married yeah and then you're like again it's like what was your end game here yeah i just i don't get it just i just i still like i just love (laughs) bringing eddie out was a business decision nothing personal oh well what a relief it's not personal it is personal to me and And the chief should be like and i give a crap because and he's just like yeah this is a surgical unit i don't give a shit about your life (laughs) spoiler alert i don't care i love how the chief uh, is just like uh please leave and then like the whole like the working of my surgical unit doesn't have any doesn't don't include my wife and then richard's just like don't include your private life like yeah and i'm like what's the way argument too here? public with your private lives on the surgical floor it needs to stop yeah he's like screaming about condoms in the hallway with meredith like the last episode <laughs> yeah, i know but when the big thing is that um the chief gave interim chief to burke and Derek is just so devastated by this. Which, and also, like, can we talk about? It? He's like, "What? You gave it to Burke?" And I'm like, "Do you not see how emotional you are right now? Like, you can't even run your own life, let alone a whole hospital." Derek. Yeah, I know. His whole life is a shit show right now. <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I feel bad for Derek, but it's like, what did you expect was going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about this quick transition. They transition from Derek slamming the door to meredith just laying awake in bed and it's maybe maybe a two second transition of her just laying awake in bed watching the rain fall outside and then they transition you know to the next scene and that's one of those scenes where it's like yes you could have gotten rid of that transition to make the episode you know smoother or just if you didn't if you had extra time or something but how much did that add just that one second Mm -hmm. I don't well, know. Kinda, I just, I love that. It seems to add so much. And it it's not hard to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. It was interesting. Like, it, in one way, it kind of adds because, you know, the last scene we saw with Meredith, she was very, very angry. And so this kind of adds, like, another level to, like, what her, she's feeling because now it's that, like, hurt, sadness kind of thing coming out. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But then it also, it, like, reflects, like, the two ways that, like, Meredith and Derek are dealing with this. Like, Derek is going and yelling at the chief about this and stuff. Well, like, Meredith is just, like, in bed and, like, so. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. But So now, let's talk about the really awkward scene where Burke tries to ask out Christina and everyone cringes. <laughs> First of all, Christina's, like, desterilizing everything. I know. The nurses probably hate her. <laughs> oh man they're so awkward like he finally like is like would you like to go to dinner with me today and she's like you know the or is the one place where i can come and think and he, and he's like yeah um so dinner <laughs> and he's just like uh i don't understand social cues <laughs> <laughs> but it's so awesome because like you read this dialogue and you're like these are the two most like socially awkward people ever and yet the whole time i was watching the scene i was like oh my god i love them 
I know. Just like who else would they be with? You know what I mean? It's 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 so weird and they're so awkward, but it's so perfect. And Burke is like, of course I get it. And I was like, do you? Because I do. Do you really? Because nobody gets it. <laughs> also, um, Izzy and George talking in the locker room. I'm pretty sure this is another new locker room. I think it was too. What's with a this different. show? So let's keep moving on to. Oh, Patricia. Mm. I also just love going back to the scene when, like, Bailey's just, like, insulting, like, Izzy and Alex's work. And Alex is just like, okay. And then she's just like, don't tempt me, Karev. And you're like, oof. (laughs) I don't know. I just really liked that. It's like turning your back on an ocean. Don't tempt. (laughs) Don't tempt the Uh, Nazi. Patricia. I'm so glad she's back. So then Derek and Burke kind of have this scene where they might as well just whip them out and measure because they're trying to like one up each other constantly and i'm like it's either they're gonna murder each other or they're going to like make out i i just love the two like derek is like oh i'm well aware of richard's recovery time i am the one who operated on him and you're like here's a gold star derek and then burke is just like i do you operated he survived and chose me to take over while recruiting your wife and you're like Damn. <laughs> what does that say about you, Derek? So this is one of those he has examples brain damage. of... Yeah. You mean and I'm you just clogged? like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, good job. <laughs> because work. you were the one that operated on him? <laughs> Derek's like, I just insulted myself. <laughs> I know, and then Burke, or is it your ex-wife? I'm a little fuzzy on that. And we're like, we all are. <laughs> yeah. And then Addison walks up. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Burke. You're never interrupting. And I was just like... Never, like, what are you talking, you just met her. Like, this could possibly be the first time that they have ever met. See, I feel like half of this is just, like, continuing on the banter between them. Because, like, she walks up and and Burke's just like, oh, look, another way to piss off Derek. (laughs) I love your (laughs) ex-wife. She's awesome. True. (laughs) True. And then, oh my god, Addison requested Meredith as an intern. How do you feel about this power play? I love it. And I, like... Uh. Even if you hate Addison, which is humanly impossible, or you're, like, the biggest Meredith and Derek shipper ever, you have to appreciate this power move. Yeah. This is amazing. Like, well, she gets in front of it. Mm-hmm. Well, and the thing that I really like about it is, like, that Meredith is just, like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. You know, like, we've seen, like... In the past, like, couple episodes, you know, like, the interns would, like, complain to Bailey or, like, Christina, like, got switched from a patient, like, two episodes ago. And Meredith is just like, you know what? Yep. I'm gonna work with my ex-boyfriend's wife. Like, bring it on. Yeah. She, it's like, they're both kind of doubling down. And Derek is like, oh, my God, this is so awkward. I have to leave. And I would, I just want to turn to Derek and just be like, you have to realize that this actually doesn't have anything to do with you in this moment. This is these two women about to, like destroy each other just because of i feel you know what i mean like i feel like it really isn't like two women fighting over Derek right now i feel like it's two women trying to like learn more about each other almost and then kill Derek. (laughs) yeah it's like they're gonna team up kill Derek, and then make out (laughs) become lesbians (laughs) and Derek's like can i be in this and they're like get away (laughs) you brought us together Derek. now die now we are stronger than ever. Okay. So we are stronger how than do you ever. feel how do you feel about Addison's first patient interaction with the worst patient ever? First off, I hate this patient. But we'll first get to off, that later. Where does she rank on zero to Zona? Oh, she's close to Zona. I feel like she and Zona could be best friends and just like burn down the world could be with like their lovers. Ugh. <laughs> Secret lovers. In the I feel red like light. she and Zona would like stand in a field that is soaked in gasoline, <laughs> and and just just like have a handful of matches, and just be ready to burn down the world. Oh my God, where'd that even come from? Oh, that was fantastic. All right, so anyway, back to the question. <laughs> it's interesting because like. At first, honestly, like, she kind of seems like a know-it-all. Um, 
like when she's interacting with the patient. You mean Addison? Yeah, Addison. Um, when she's like interacting with the patient, because there really isn't any of that. Like, like it almost seems like she's trying to like impress Meredith in a way. Yeah. Like, and the whole like, I expect you to know that, Gray, and they're like, what? And then like the patient is just like, hey, I'm I'm still here. <laughs> Well, in the first half of this episode, the writers are trying to get you to hate Addison. And in the second half, they're trying to get you to love Addison, which is just another example of when they make you stereotype in your head and then pull the rug out from under you. Again, yeah. it's awesome. Because then we have like these moments, like later she's like, which luckily for you, I am. Like, she's just like, that's right. I'm awesome. Get over it. I'm the best surgeon ever. Meredith. Suck it. And then she, like, calls Meredith, like, the hospital's most popular intern, which is such I mean, a low blow. I mean, she's basically calling her a whore. Yeah. Like, it's such a low blow. Um, yeah. And Again, and you're like, ugh, I hate this woman. But, but then, then by but, the like, end, you, you've but, like, made a 180. Two seconds later, she's just like, chin up, Gray. I'm just tough on everyone. And then she, like, goes into, like, even more low blows. But I'm just like, what? This woman... <laughs> This is just proof that Addison should be working at this hospital because she loudly discusses personal details of her life <laughs> in the middle of the hallway close to patients. Oh, Addison man. belongs here. I know, it's so great. <laughs> she belongs with them. So, George's storyline, let's get into that. Oh my god. So basically He is George a surgical is sponge. <laughs> That's like so gross. <laughs> But also, like, the fact that the chief was like, oh, yeah, George will tell me the thing. And you're like, the chief literally picked the best intern for this time because George can't lie to, like, a statue. <laughs> Could you know what? what I mean? Like, he can't lie to anyone. He oh, can he lie can't to an inanimate lie. object. Like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, like, he if he sees something, he can't lie to the chief. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the chief literally was like, all right, which one of the interns can I break easily? Yep, this one. <laughs> Because I feel like anyone else, like Izzy, would have just been like, no. Or like she would have told him some weird thing about like baking. Well, here's the thing about this episode. I feel like they kind of, they really wanted to go into Derek and Burke being competitive. They really wanted to go into Derek, Meredith, Addison, all that. And then they're like, crap, what do we do with Izzy, Alex, and George? And it, it's obvious when you... Look at it from just reading like a script. It's pretty obvious that they were like, oh, I don't know what to do with them. But when you're watching the episode, it seems so natural. Yeah. Like, this is a great storyline that they came up with. And I don't think that this was the original intent, but it's awesome. Like, he's just, George is just wandering around in the background of all these scenes. And it's so funny. (laughs) Well, and it kind of fits because I feel like this episode has a whole theme about like secrets being revealed. Mm-hmm. in that kind of like sense and like the repercussions of them and so like it works in so like it's not just like they were like hmm, george yeah he'll do this and you're like um what like it goes it mixes with the whole episode so well that it's just like like he literally like he's a freaking intern and he's like walking around the hospital like looking for gossip all day and you're like yep totally believable do you want to talk about the scene where um, Izzy and Alex are talking about the different patients and Alex can't remember their names or anything and Izzy can? What a great w- showing and not telling moment. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I, think I just, just love these kind of scenes. Yeah, it just further emphasizes that, you know, going back to what... Um, Liz said you know about some surgeons remember the names of their patients and some don't this is like the best example of it because Alex is just like oh yeah like he like names them like colon dude hernia chick and so like that whereas Izzy is like oh yeah this is their room number this is their hair color this is what they do like his wife mom was all the time like yeah it's a mom with really cute kids like Mm -hmm. this is what happened to her last night like and all that stuff and so I feel like like it's almost bringing that fact back which was like you know all the way back in like episode four of season one it's or such a, yeah it's episode four it's such a simple scene but it's so good yeah and the whole alex izzy storyline is izzy is convinced that alex is just this asshole that is not remotely human and so that's what the whole izzy yeah. alex storyline is and so we'll see at the end that he is human and that izzy is surprised by this but i just gotta read this line do you ever wake up in the morning and realize nobody likes you and, I don't know, care? 
What a great line. I feel I love it just because like if anyone else had said that to anyone else in this like it would have been weird. But the fact that Izzy says it to Alex just works. Yeah, I know. Mm, love it. <laughs> it's good. So then basically we have this like weird Christina Berg scene where they like fight and then they just kind of start making out. This is the one time that I don't really like what Burke does in this yeah. scene because it reminds me overtly of Owen and I hate Owen and I'm like gross. He like attacks her face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like and then he just pans up and like George and then is standing leaves. there. Yeah. And George is like oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can like I literally feel like because the scene right after this is George in, like, the chief's room. And I can literally see George, like, walking around the hospital for, like, hours being like, what do I tell the chief? What do I tell the chief? <laughs> like, in between these two scenes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is just great. George is just, oh. <laughs> He's so pathetic. So what about the scene where George and Alex are in a scene with Joe? Mm-hmm. And just having Joe in the scene makes you see george and alex so differently yeah well I first mean, off yeah joe and alex are like friends and you're like holy crap evil spawn has made friends what uh, although you have to remember that he's a bartender so his best friend in seattle is a bartender but yeah which i mean is sad but it's like it's still you're like what more than derek has <laughs> um and he's caring and about something. He he cares about Joe's bar a lot, which yeah. again, it's a bar, but well, still, even, like, he... Joe is a person. And you're like, oh. and then he's like, look, I'll pay my dab. And then he like opened his wallet and he's like, crap, I'm an intern. I make nothing. <laughs> no thing. Well, I just have said no thing. No thing. thing. Well, and it's also like showing the audience that Alex is human, but Izzy hasn't seen it yet. Yeah. So it's setting up for this this thing that's going to happen at the end. Yeah. But it's also like, it's still like, you know, you see that human moment, but then you're still like, it's with a bartender and he's paying his tab. So you're kind of like, okay, like, it's still Alex, you know, like, he's not like cuddling a kitten or something. And you're like, oh, he's changed. (laughs) Like, yeah, no. Yeah. But I kind of, I like that. And then (laughs) George is just like standing over there and Joe is like, hey, champ. And George is like, shit, Alex noticed me. Run. (laughs) George is like, please don't punch me again. I know I punched you, but please don't punch me don't hurt me and then ugh, this is the bread and butter of our podcast like like i want to say one third or two thirds of our podcast is just us complaining about horrible patients so i'm i'm ready the gloves are coming off julie is horrible i'm sorry this doctor is performing an ultrasound on your sick children And you have the audacity to look at her and go, what does it take to go after another woman's husband? Dude, if I was Meredith, I would have like grabbed a scalpel off the table and like stabbed this woman in her stomach and like killed her babies and been like, suck it. (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) I hate this woman. She is so rude. I know. And I'm like, oh, sorry, Julie. Did I miss the part where this was any of your business? Like, she overheard that. She has no idea any of the story behind this. Like, don't be a freaking jerk, Julie. Just because your husband cheated on you, which, by the way, we all know why he did. No shock there. Because you're awful. (laughs) She's just like, Jeff moved in with this long leg miniskirt who answers his phone. Three weeks in my pregnancy. And I'm like, first of all, good for you, Jeff, because this woman is toxic. Ugh. (laughs) That's unfortunate, Julie. (laughs) But no one loves you. Yeah, nobody cares. And so are we comparing Meredith to a long-legged miniskirt girl who answers the phones? Because that's enough to make me want to murder Julie. Excuse me? You're talking about Meredith freaking gray here. Yeah. Well, and it's also just weird because you're literally like saying this to a woman who's like your doctor. And it's like... And you don't even know the story. What an asshole. It's just like, like this woman is doing a service to you. Like you don't insult people who are doing you services yeah ugh there's this mm, Julie like, because is everything then she that's wrong. just turns around and is like oh i'm sorry we can't help you and like kicks you out of the hospital like what do you do then julie yeah meredith is like i'm sorry about your husband and then julie's like are you sorry about dr montgomery shepherd's husband and i'm yeah. like and meredith just, is just like mm, i hope your labs suck <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, she's coding. Guess who's not going to hit the code blue button anymore? <laughs> Let me just take a nap for a second. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm going to say this, and maybe this is why they made her so horrible, is that it's supposed to bring up the narrative that there's a lot of times when people will look at cheating and mm-hmm. always blame the the, the mistress instead of mister? the husband. No, no, no. Like, like when a husband cheats on his wife, there is something about our society where we always assume that it's, oh, it's like, well, she's such a whore. What, like, the mistress like is she to blame. Him. Yeah, and I'm like, what about the dude that cheated on his wife? Why yeah. aren't we blaming him? So maybe that's why they do something like this. Yeah. Brings up, like, all the humiliation and, like, de- degrading feelings that both Meredith and Addison must be feeling. That's all I can really think. That's the only explanation of why I would include Julie, because she's horrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, she's, like, Zona level. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. But then I just love, you know, you have that whole intense scene where you're just like, ugh, Julie sucks. And literally they cut to Christina, who, like, literally, like, just walks into Joe's room and just, like, beelines for the toilet and just pukes. And, like, that just, like, comes back and is like, I'm going to check your vitals. <laughs> Yeah, and Joe's like, ew, you smell horrible. <laughs> hey, sunshine. I love Joe. Yeah, I know. He already, like, flawlessly fits into this uh, show. He does. It's great. And then we actually do cut to George trying to figure out, like, what to tell the chief, which, you know, was my vision. So, uh-huh. mm-hmm. but he's in front of the pubes. And, <laughs> yeah, he's in front of the babies. And oh please i know i was just like i'm waiting i was waiting for her to just like come around the corner and be like oh please get out of here and then meredith just like tackles her <laughs> but uh um just for all you you know listening for or just watching the show for the first time make note of this scene and compare it to a scene in season four episode one you'll know what i'm talking about so meredith walks up and she says this like really sad thing that I wanted to talk about on the podcast that I feel like George just kind of like brushes over. It is so self-defeating. Oh my God. When she goes, I wore my new lip gloss because my ex-boyfriend's wife looks like Isabella freaking, freaking Rosalini and I'm just like me. I'm trying to outdo her when she's the victim here. How crazy is that? And I was like, oh, she's literally like, resorting to making herself look more physically attractive because Derek has lowered this girl's self-esteem so much. Mm-hmm. I want to cry. Yeah. I just love George. He's so cute. Like, he's you look nice today. <laughs> I like the whole, like, sorry, you know, gloss prevents chapped lips. <laughs> and you're like, you're so cute for trying, George. And then Meredith says, I'm an evil mistress. And I was like, oh, this is so sad. Like, Derek... I mean, I get that she didn't let Derek explain, but the fact that, it's just sad that she he's sees making her see herself that way. Yeah. When, like, it wasn't her fault at all. Yeah. Because she had no... Like, it's not like she's going to, like, stalk this guy, like, on the internet, and, like, like we do now, but, you know. Like MySpace. So George confesses that um, Bert Chris- <laughs> kissed Christina. I just love- Can you think of any reason, any reason at all, really, why Christina would be kissing Bert? And you're like, hmm, maybe possible CPR, George, but, you know, I don't really know. <laughs> It's like, George, how did you not put this together? I just, uh, can you think of any reason why two people would be kissing each other? Uh, Maybe they're together, you idiot. I feel like half of that is just George being naive and he's like, uh, people like, why would she be kissing her boss? Like, this is so bad. She shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so so when, like, maybe there's another reason. <laughs> right. Yeah. When. Maybe he's coercing her. Meredith finally confronts christina about this christina says no it's we are not the same as you and mcdreamy you guys were in a relationship and she goes we're switzerland we're we're, we are neutral it's very neutral there and they make nice watches but what do you think about that she sees what she's doing as like i actually do believe that she thinks what she's doing is completely different from what meredith and derek did well, is that like a coping me- mechanism or well i think in christina's eyes all her and Burke have done has had sex in the on-call room 
so she's like like i don't think christina herself sees that as a relationship like even though we have burke making obvious attempts to make this a relationship i don't think that's what christina sees it as Mm -hmm. that's why she was so reluctant in the beginning of the episode yeah because she's like oh my god it's a relationship i'm gonna turn out like meredith i just find that interesting that it's like on paper you guys are doing the exact same thing yet she doesn't want to admit that it's the same thing and one of the best lines from meredith meredith oh my god it's just brilliant in this episode is when you know they want to talk about the baby or she wants to talk about the baby and christina doesn't well, why even confide in me at all? If you're so intent on not discussing it, why even tell me? I just love yeah. it. Yeah. Let's cut back to uh, Julie. Ugh, Julie. Who then wants us to take more pity on her by telling us even more about miniskirt. Ugh. God, I freaking hate her. Also, first off, she calls this mistress up and takes her to lunch. I'm sorry. If I was sleeping with someone else's husband and the wife calls me up and is like, hey, let's go to lunch. I'd say no. I'd be like, mm, I'd flee the no. country. <laughs> Especially if she's Julie. Julie's crazy. Mm-mm. It was ab- about at this point in the episode where I was like, can we just stop and talk about the fact that I want to push this chick in front of a moving train? Yeah. Well, and then I think it's the inappropriate line- on so many levels. Yeah. I can't. Well, it's also interesting because, you know, like what we were talking about earlier and like blaming and stuff. Because Julie says, I just wanted to put a face on the bitch that got my husband to throw away 15 years of marriage, which is super interesting because the way that she phrases that sentence is 100% she is blaming the girl. And it's like, right. And you want to be not like, what Meredith needs to hear. Well, and it's just like, what about like the fact that your husband threw away 15 years of marriage? Like what got him to do that? Like, yeah. I don't think it was just like, some, she, like, cute girl walking by. Like, there had to have been something else going on. Mm-hmm. And because, Julie's playing the complete victim here. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Like, after you said that and I, like, read that line again, I was like, oh, my gosh. That's, like, exactly what Emily just said. Yeah. Uh, she takes the high road in all of this. Yeah. And it's so refreshing like i would have like gotten down and just like murdered julie i would have yelled at her and be like i didn't even know but meredith doesn't say a word and yeah. i gained so much respect for her addison gained so much respect for her it's just mm. meredith is really just like a, a really good person here to not say anything mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, oh, next scene freaking bailey me i'm dr Dr. dr mcdreamy i'm tall handsome i like to lean against things and ponder the difficulties of dating beautiful women i'm trying to be a surgeon here and burke is like i don't understand who people are i love how burke he goes who the hell is dr mcdreamy like i just love bailey literally says what everyone's thinking and it's just like are we in a freaking hospital or what why are we talking about this crap like let's go be doctors how amazing is it that uh, Derek and Addison already have the back and forth that seems like a married couple? Yes, they do. It's so good. They, the two actors interacting with each other is just really effective. They're so good. I'm looking at a screenshot that I took. With her hair and his hair, they would make a super baby with like amazing <laughs> <The best> hair. <laughs> hairs. Hairs. <laughs> hair. Like oh Those my three God. hairs on that baby's head would be perfect. <laughs> Oh my god. It would be amazing. But yeah. And then I just love when Meredith, Dr. Shepard, and both of them are like, yes. And she's just like, ugh. <laughs> she's like, I walked right into that one. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and then Derek's like, Meredith, Meredith. And then Meredith's like, don't. And then walks away. <laughs> talk to the hand because the face don't want to talk to you, boy. Mm-mm. Whoa. Where did that come from? Did you never used to say that in, like, middle school? No, I was cooler than that. Well, then. <laughs> so let's cut over to Julie again. Yeah. Basically, also, look at the painting in the background. What does that say? Bunny Kula? It's, Bunny-cula? like, supposed to, I think it's supposed to be, like, Dracula, but, like, Bunny Kula. <laughs> Back, Bun Kula? <laughs> I don't even know how to say that. It's B U N N I C U L A for those of you that want to try to pronounce it. And it's just a picture of a bunny like staring out at us. What the? Hell? It's torturing Julie. 
I would love it if that was the picture on the ultrasound. <laughs> You're having bunnies. <laughs> and then they're just like both staring out at the ultrasound. <laughs> Bunny Kula. So basically her twins are in heart failure. That's karma, yeah, Julie. She's just an ass. She's just a turd. She's just a horrible person. It's like, <laughs> oh, so that's why Jeff left you. They're all getting ready to watch Joe's surgery. And I love, because this is like really the scene where we start getting all of the like Joe stories, which I love because it just makes it more like seem like this guy has been a part of the show for even longer mm-hmm. than like the audience has. Because Bailey is like talking about like how when she was an intern, like Joe and her were friends and it's so cute. Like, cause he's well, just she like. Was, uh, one interesting thing. She was the only female intern of the year. Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. But I just love, Joe was the first person here to tell me that I'd make a good surgeon. Not that he knew anything about it, but it was something when I had nothing. And I just, yeah. like, I like that little glimpse of, like, her being this softer person. And you're like, whoa, what, what, what happened? Yeah. But it's kind of cool. That's, like, a little bit more, of like, character development in her sense. Getting that softer side of Bailey. Yeah. And then Alex and Izzy are just, you know, Izzy hanging snacks. out and... <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm not a huge fan of this Alex and Izzy storyline until the end. Throughout the whole episode, I'm just like, what is... Like it almost, Like I said before, it's just it feels like they didn't know what they were doing with Alex and Izzy. Mm-hmm. But then the writers are just so genius. Like, they can take basically nothing. Like, this storyline is basically, you know, nothing. It's just a throwaway storyline. And make it so meaningful that by the end, you're like, holy crap, that was like the best storyline ever. It's great. Yeah. And Catherine Heigl, every facial expression that she has in this episode, of course, is amazing. The Joe stories. Let's go and let's talk about Derek's. Do you want to read Derek's? Sure. Okay. I went to Joe's place the night before I started working here. I'd only been in town, you know, a few days. I met this woman. I got drunk and she took advantage of me. Or she got drunk and I took advantage of her. I got drunk and she took... No. We were drunk. Definitely. Definitely. Someone took advantage. Either way, I like to look at it as my initiation into Seattle. What about you? Oh, I don't have one. I just wanted to hear yours. I was like, in your face, Derek. Pow, pow, pow. (laughs) But it's also like, I get that he was trying to like make this like, oh, yes, Meredith. But like, just the way he says it, like, oh, yeah, someone took advantage. And you're like, ew. (laughs) And we're like, yeah, because Meredith clearly took advantage of you. Right. Well, and then the whole like, I like to look at it as my initiation into Seattle. He's telling this story like it's this fun little, like, quirk about him and not what's currently blowing up his entire life. Well, I feel like this would be a lot cuter if it was, like, they were, like, married and he was, like, ah, yes, Joe's story, like, this is how we, like, I feel like that would be the case. But, like, your wife literally just came into town and ruined your whole relationship. And he's, like, also, everyone knows who you're talking about. Yeah. And, like, Christine, like, her best friend is in that OR. Yeah. And I'm, like, Derek, I'm... God, it's another example of, I really don't think he knows how big of a deal this is. I, yeah. I, I just don't think he's grasping it. It's just interesting. And then we cut over to a different OR where, like, Meredith is just, like, creepily staring at Addison, which has always interests me because it's almost like Meredith is studying Addison in the way that we all want to, like, study Addison, and we're just like, oh, we're dying to know. And I feel like it's one of those scenes that if they considered doing an episode like this in or just a scene like this nowadays in Grey's Anatomy it would seem quote unprofessional and they would take it out but it's these little scenes like this and then the laying awake in from the beginning of the episode where I feel like the audience gets insight to how the characters are feeling it's like an emotional connection that the later seasons are just so clinical Mm-hmm. and they don't offer any emotional connection it's just like a natural little scene that i kind of like but it, it's so quirky but it's so like good it's just yeah. like a really good scene yeah so I, I mentioned something here about about izzy slowly starting to see alex as more human throughout this episode mm-hmm. and that i mean if you've watched tv before you know that alex is on the trajectory from bad boy to like a good man and they're gonna use izzy and i think around this time the first time i watched the show i was kind of like okay that's cool but again why do they have to do this they've they've done it so many times and gray's 
actually ends up not doing it right away, which is good. But yeah, I mean, how do you feel about that? See, I kind of like it because it's almost like it's subtle, but it's not like because I feel like some other shows would do the oh, he's a bad guy. And then like, oh, now he's like cuddling babies and like stuff like that. And they kind of do it a lot more slowly. And even Seasons. when I feel, yeah. And even when I feel like he's, you know, quote, like a better person, he still has his like intense bad boy, like Alex kind of scenes every once in a while. And so I kind of like that, like, at least, you know, the seasons that I really like until they like destroy everyone. Um, <laughs> he's still like, you know, like he's definitely grown as a human being, but he still has that like inch of his own personality. Like he, yeah. didn't, he didn't completely because like, honest to God, like, you know, you grow as a human, but I feel like people don't just completely like 180 change everything. Yeah. And, and so that's just not realistic. Yeah. And so I like how he still, like, has those moments up until, you know, like, season six or seven. Yeah, it gets a little hazy around five and six. Yeah, whatever. So. Everything just dies. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk about the Burke chief scene where the chief says that they're the same. Do you think Burke likes it when the chief says we're the same? Because I feel like that's kind of what he has been wanting since, because we can flash back to season one, episode two, when he's just like, why, why aren't I, you know, the right choice for the chief anymore or whatever. And so when the chief says like, you and I, we're the same, I feel like the chief is like, I'm giving you a huge compliment. This is what you've always wanted to hear, Burke. And now Burke is realizing that maybe he doesn't want to be the same as the chief. And I think the main reason is Christina. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that. Because, you know, you had that whole scene, season one, episode two, you know, like, he didn't have anyone. I think Burke's sole purpose, you know, in season one when we met him was surgery, becoming chief, that whole career path. And I feel like Christina changed that. I mean, you had a scene earlier in this episode where he's, like, trying to, like, take, you know, like, whatever the heck this is into, like, a relationship status. And he's trying to, like, care about her. And then the chief kind of says that. And he's like, this is what I want. But I also know, like, the strain it's had on other aspects of the chief's life. And, you know, like, now I have Christina in my life or, like, sort of in my life. Well, I think it's, he's it's confused the, about the, that. It's the classic what the heart wants versus what the brain wants. Yeah. It's, like, the career, like, drivenness versus, like, a relationship, possible love, you know, like, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think at the t- and I think it also like takes him by surprise when the chief says it and it's kind of like oh well and um, it's also the chief is kind of saying the line is we put the job first you know yeah. and I think he's almost saying and Derek doesn't so this is that's why I came to the conclusion that I wanted you to be yeah in a room chief I, like i think yeah. as soon as he woke up and saw Derek kissing meredith on the forehead he was like well interim chief goes to burke yeah and that's i think it also like woke burke up to like what he was doing because i think that is a direct hit at like Derek does not take the job first and i feel like burke in a sense was also like i haven't been taking the job first because you know the next scene we have is him basically breaking this whole thing off with christina and so i think mm-hmm he like really took this to heart and is like the chief doesn't know that like I've been questioning like that I've been making other decisions and I need to stop that and keep putting the job first because this is what I want no see I read that differently I read it as I know logically that I've been working for this my whole career and I know that in my brain this is what I want and so I'm gonna break up with Christina but it's the hardest thing I have to do because it's like My heart wants this, but my brain is telling me not to. And he, I feel like even when he is in the middle of breaking up with her, he's unsure that Mm -hmm. this is a good idea, that this is what he really wants. Mm -hmm. But there's this cute little scene where like she walks in and she's like, that was the most amazing surgery I've ever witnessed. You killed a man and brought him back to life. You like raised the dead. God, how does that feel? Are you rushing? And Burke like smiles and it's like this cute little like, like the chemistry is insane and he goes like you wouldn't believe and yeah the, it's just so like like he can't control his emotions around her and then he like goes and 
breaks up with yeah. her. But well, I think like I said, like... I feel like he doesn't want to. He just knows he has to. I was about to say, I think that's something that he's like, you know, she makes me happy and everything. But it's also like he's been working like theoretically, you know, like he's been thinking about being chief for a long time now. And so he's like, this is something I have to do in order to get to like the place where I've wanted to be for so long. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like a like a business like it's like it is it's like a business transaction or, or like something that's like I have to do this. And Burke kind of uses the chief's line. He goes, "We both put the job first. You were very focused. I respect that." And Christine is like, "Thank you." Or it's so weird. It's like it's the weirdest breakup like honestly ever. Shocker. Cuz they're not the weirdest couple yeah. ever. Because I just love, like, they have this whole thing. He's like, you're very focused. I respect that. And she's like, thank you. You're welcome. And then she's like, oh, you're ending this. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. But here, let's talk about Christina's point of view here. She, she throughout the whole episode, like, no, we're Switzerland. We're different. We're not you and, and Derek, you know? And then at the end, he she's just like, oh, yeah, I, I do kind of want to go out to dinner with you because you know, I'm I'm going to lean into this and try, and then he breaks up with her. Well, I think the interesting thing about Christina and all of this, like, we've seen this before of, like, where Burke tries something with her, and she's at first, res- like, resistant, but then he'll do, like, a cool surgery or something, and she's just like, oh my god, you're amazing. And so it's almost like the glimpse of, like, is she, like, does she like Burke, or does she like him as a, sur- like, as a surgeon do you understand what i'm saying yeah and that's a huge theme in the whole christina burke relationship like i feel like the fact that he's an awesome surgeon is her her number one turn on yeah for for him yeah which is still like really interesting that's another argument that a lot of anti christina burke people will use against me it's just it's interesting because I feel like until this episode, the both of them are kind of just, oh, this is casual. This is just, you know, yeah. us like sleeping together. Mm-hmm. And then both of them in this episode are forced to realize that they actually do care about each other. And then they break up. In some and sense, so yeah. it's, it's, but it's genius because it's like, as an audience, we're watching it and we're like, holy crap, they both like actually really like each other. And then they break up in this episode and instantly the audience is rooting for them to get back together. Yeah. Just because they want the re- the resolution of, oh, Burke actually has feelings for her. Holy crap, like, Christina actually put herself out there. For, and and then it's taken away from you as soon as you get it. So mm-hmm. it's awesome. Yeah. All right, so now on to George's whole thing of what he's been working on all episode. So basically, George found a way to get joe to not have to pay so much for the surgery which is really interesting because i feel like this is one of the few storylines where we see george like really really passionate about something like he stood like stood up to the chief earlier like in this scene he literally is just like is really fighting for this and i think it's really interesting to just see george coming out of that comfort zone and like fighting back about something that he's passionate about and so this scene that we're about to see he basically goes into the chief and he's just like chief like i'm not gonna be able to do this like telling be the sponge and the chief is just kind of like cool i signed this thing for joe joe and o'malley's like oh thank you and then the chief is like never yell at me again o'malley one thing that i will say about this scene is that it immediately endears joe to us more because it seems like Mm -hmm. all the other characters care a lot about joe yeah so i feel like that was the whole point of this storyline was like yeah Here's this new character that we supposedly we're supposed to like and we don't know why. And then they're trying to prove to you why. Because all these characters you already like love him. So you should love him too. Is kind of the point of it. And it's effective. But I just kind of like, I mean, you see, because the only other time George really stood up to a superior was when the the anesthesiologist was drinking before surgeries. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of cool, like seeing Jim seeing George have, like, a backbone and, like, sticking up for something that he's really passionate about and cares about. Not too big of a storyline compared to everything else that's going on in this episode. Freaking Julie and her horribleness. Yeah, because basically she's just like, Julie wants Dr. Gray taken off the case. And then she just, this this line, 
just reminds me of someone I don't like very much. Someone my husband likes a lot, particularly in lingerie. And then she like looks at Addison. You understand. And Addison is like, Meredith is standing right there. I was like, I am going to kill you. Oh, it's just so like, I don't know. How cringeworthy is that? It's rude. It's, oh my God. Like, remember when I hated Mrs. Glass? Yes. And Christina like shut the Mrs. Glass up? Yeah. Oh my God. I have not hated a patient this much since Zona. Yeah. And then Addison just owns her. Can I say it? (laughs) Yes. Miss Phillips, I lack Dr. Gray's class and patience, so let me set the record straight. My husband didn't cheat on me, I cheated on him. So the wronged woman here, Dr. Gray. So, I think you owe her one hell of an apology. Ugh, it just gives me chills. Because this is the moment where you're like, holy crap, what happened in their relationship? Because this is the first... Yeah, and... And this this is when you see, like... Because, you know, before we were really putting the blame on Derek, we were like, Derek's at fault. Why didn't he tell Meredith he was, like, married or whatever? And then you're like, wait, no, maybe Addison's at fault. Meredith is the true victim. Like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, either way, Meredith is the true victim. Yeah, well. Because she she didn't know. But just Addison admitting that she has some fault in this makes us like her so much more. And I think that it really shocked Meredith when this happened. She was just like, not just that she's getting more of the story, but that, like, Addison stood up for her. Yeah. Meredith was being bullied by this Miss Phillips all yeah. freaking day. And well, Addison and- was like, no, I'm going to shut this down. Like, you shut up about well, Meredith. Well, and the fact like- that, like, Addison full out says that, like, Meredith is the, like, victim in all of this. And I kind of like that because all episodes she's been, like, getting these little, like, hits at Meredith. Like, oh, you sleeping with my husband and, like, all this stuff. And then mm-hmm. finally in the scene, she's like, she is the victim so don't talk to her like that. Like Yeah. I love the like another woman standing up for the like a woman yeah. in this and scene. Especially like because this is another thing like where you're like Addison and Meredith should hate each other theoretically, you know? But then Addison is like, no, like I'm gonna stand up for this woman because I'm the one that was wrong. She had nothing to do with any of this. And so she is the victim. And mm-hmm. it's like, even though like my husband obviously likes her. And like all this stuff, like I'm going to stand up to her because that's what's right. And you're like, yeah, Ugh. yeah. Addison is definitely not black and white in this scene. Yeah. Or just in general. But like this, this one little line, suddenly everything we thought we knew about Addison goes out the window and we're like, holy crap, like there's a lot more there. And I just cannot wait to un- unpackage it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So then we cut immediately over to... Derek finally getting to explain and he's at his shithole trailer and <laughs> <laughs> drinking he's a beer good. and Meredith is there. So I know I just read the other one, but do you mind if I read this? Because I know all the pauses and stuff. Sure. Can I be Meredith? Okay. Then? Yeah. All right. One night I parked my car. I unlocked the front door, my front door, go inside my house and there's something different. Nothing's different. Everything's the same. But yet, still, something's different. And I stand there for a while. And then I know. See, there are moments for me, you know, usually when I'm in the OR, when I just know what's going to happen next. So I go upstairs. As I'm walking down the hall, I'm trying to prepare myself for what I'm going to see when I go into my bedroom. I step in a man's jacket that doesn't belong to me. And everything I think I know just shifts. Because the jacket that doesn't belong to me is a jacket that I recognize. And what I know now is that when I go into my bedroom, I'm not just going to see that my wife is cheating on me. I'm going to see that my wife is cheating on me with Mark, who happened to be my best friend. It's just so pedestrian, common, and dirty, and cruel. Mostly just cruel. I left, came out here. And you met me. And I met you. Well, what was I to you? The girl you screwed to get over being screwed? You were like coming up for fresh air. It was like I was drowning and you saved me. That's all I know. It's not enough. Yeah. I like the, I like the line where she goes, well, what was I to you? The girl you screwed to get over being screwed? Yeah. And then I, I just love 
like his you were like coming up for fresh air it's like i was drowning and you saved me and i just like that because first off it's so symbolic for like things that happen later well in the imagery of just that that like yeah somebody drowning in, in well, sorrow and second i think that you really get the glimpse here that like meredith doesn't was like wasn't just another girl to derek mm-hmm. like this was actually something and that is kind of where you see like him you like feeling sorry for him because you're like he just lost something that was again. really good for him yeah again and so but like it blurs those lines even more the brilliance of meredith just looking at him in the hurt on ellen pompeo's face is yeah. brilliant she's just like so hurt and she kind of looks away for a minute and then she looks back at him and you can tell she's like holding back tears just yeah. brilliant like ellen great job and she goes it's not enough and it's another one of those lines where they take this huge idea and concept and they boil it down to one sentence. And it's perfect and it's all you need to know. Like, you, can't, you couldn't have written a better response than yeah. that. Because well, it just, just sums it up. It's so realistic. And I just love how she doesn't accept this. It's like, yeah, like, I get that Addison hurt you. But for him to turn around and lie to Meredith, like, that wasn't right. You know, two wrongs don't make her right and just you explaining what happened isn't enough for her to forgive him mm-hmm. and it's like yeah. and the fact that like addison cheated on you like yeah it sucks but it doesn't forgive him lying to her and hurting her like he did yeah and i just kind of and i like how it's just simply like it's not enough it's just so simple yet like i literally have done the exercise where if i had to if I could not say it's not enough, what would I say in that in that situation? Like, say you weren't allowed to write that and you had to rewrite a response to that. You it you just can't. Like, it's perfect. Mm-hmm. So, The City by Joe Purdy starts playing. And this song, matching with the ending of this speech, is one and the same. Like, I just... You can't even have the end of this episode without this song and you can't have this song without the end of the episode to me they just are the same thing yeah and we kind of get the like wrap up of like alex being a better person because he hears what joe what george did for joe and he like hugs george which you're like uh, uh, yeah he goes i heard what you did champ and then like hugs george and not gonna lie without fail every time i watch that i tear up every single time i almost cry it is it's it's just like a good scene where it's like yeah like they just got in a fight but like alex recognizes what george just did for like this person that he cares about it's it's just like an utterly amazing way to show humanity and i feel like humanity is such a good theme for an episode of television because it's so meaningful to a lot of people and so deep and uh, it's just brilliant like izzy looks up and sees them hugging and she just kind of like nods to herself. And I, mm, I almost cry every time. Yeah. It's so perfect. Oh, and then we have such an iconic ending scene. Yeah, this is one of those mirror shots where it started in the bar and it ends in the bar. Oh. And it's just so good. Do you want to read it? I want to yeah. read it. Who do you want to be? Can I be Christina? Sure. The clinic has a policy. They wouldn't let me confirm my appointment unless I designated an emergency contact person. Someone to be there just in case and to help me home, you know, after. Anyway, I put your name down. That's why I told you I'm pregnant. You're my person. I am? Yeah, you are. Whatever. Whatever. He dumped me. You realize this constitutes hugging. Shut up. I'm your person. Like, ugh. Also, Meredith wearing the Dartmouth shirt. Woo! Like, ugh, it's such a good scene. And you're like, ugh. There's no way to explain or to understand the importance of this scene until you're doing a rewatch. But let's just say it's a huge deal and it really tugs at the heartstrings. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just, I love how you have this whole episode that's like so emotionally horrible for Christina and Meredith and yet they end it on such like 
this scene, which like normally they were like, these two aren't emotional. Like they don't like lovey dovey scenes, but like you have just this sweet moment between them and you're like, oh, uh, you yeah. know, like their lives are falling apart. Oh, there's that humanity again. You yeah. know, like you're my person. You. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So they say that practice makes perfect. Theory is the more you think like a surgeon, the more you become one better you get at remaining neutral, clinical, cut, suture, close. The harder it becomes to turn it off, to stop thinking like a surgeon, and to remember what it means to think like a human being. Yeah. Good ending. That's a good one. I love that. What a great theme, humanity. Yeah. That's a great theme. It is. It's it's right up there with faith for me. Yeah. So seriously count is zero. So (sighs) that's so sad. Patient rankings. We both have three. Because there were only three patients. Oh my god. (laughs) Number three, as y'all can think, was Julie. But she would have been at negative infinity if I could have ranked her correctly. My (laughs) my number three is the chief. Um, Julie. He didn't do much for me as a patient. He was basically just the chief in a hospital bed. So, you know what I mean? I mean there wasn't really much it, like, there. That, like, yeah, like, she did a lot for the whole Meredith Addison. Oh, my God. Like, she's, uh, yeah, that's what, that's why I put her, you know, in a different position. Yeah. Because I feel like, and honestly, I could have put her at one. Ugh. Just. See, her so second. what's your number just, two? Ugh. The chief. Okay. So, my number two is Julie. And after the conversations that we had, you know, together today, I honestly think that I could have put her at one just because it really starts the narrative of why do we always blame the woman when the man is at fault? Yeah. And and woman power and Addison Meredith teaming up and like you can hate her, but that's the point. You know what I mean? I hate her. But that's the point of her character. Yeah. Whatever. So so our number one is the same then. It's Joe. Joe. I mean, we we know he's going to be integral in this show. They do a, a great job of blending him in and making you feel like he's always existed in this universe. And yeah, we've well, learned we learned so much about the characters through these Joe stories. Well, yeah, and I just love how like you know he technically is you know, like Burke, um, Derek, and then Christina's patient, but he like interacts and is like involving like he just has these moments with like every single character that you're like it doesn't matter that he's like not their patient like he's everyone's well, patient i almost. mean yeah you can actually make the argument that everyone except maybe meredith and addison had their whole story arc for this episode surrounding joe yeah in a way basically yeah do you have any changes i do not i actually have some stuff Ugh. I'm, i was very surprised uh, mostly because I, I I was so trying to nitpick because we haven't had a make one change in like half a season. So my make one change is I get that Derek is the main character of this show and we're supposed to love him. But let's not go over the fact that, yes, Addison cheated on him with her, with his best friend. That's got to hurt. But he is a scumbag in in this episode. Like, I get that he's McDreamy and he says stuff like, you were like coming up for fresh air. But they really didn't address the fact that he lied to Meredith and did kind of one of the, something that I see as one of the most hurtful things you can do to somebody is enter a romantic relationship. And she basically fell in love with him. And I don't care who you are, he knew that. He knew that she was falling for him. And he still did it. And it just makes the beginning of season one so creepy that he pushed so hard to get her to go out with him. And this happened. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe push the fact that he's more of a scumbag because he came off as a charming McDreamy in this episode and he really shouldn't have. And two is kind of a joke. More Izzy. <laughs> Where you at, Catherine? Always. So that's that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Do you have anything else? Uh, I don't think so. So, 
If you like the podcast, as always, please go rate and review us on iTunes. If you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet at us. I'm at Hazard underscore Emily. Becca is at Anderson underscore Becca. We also have a separate account for the podcast, which is at Grays Uncut. If you have a longer comment or question, you can send it to our email, which is Grey's Anatomy Uncut at gmail.com. And next week, we're doing Season 2, Episode 2, Enough is Enough. It is written by James D. Perriott. I think he wrote Episode 4 of Season... Yeah, he wrote... Oh, my yeah. God. He wrote Zona. And... Oh, and no. oh, oh, good Lord. And it's directed by Peter Horton again. Yeah. So, that, that's always a solid choice. I'm a big Horton fan. All right, signing off. See ya. Bye. Bye.